This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV, the Kia EV9, with available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults, with zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute and available lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. A science story, huh? He's an oil scientist. They I felt, felt I feel right. right. I was so and I just thought, well, I figured it out. I it was that tall. golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true stories of how science has affected people's lives. A quick reminder, we're in the middle of a fundraising drive. Head to storycollider.org slash donate to help out. We also have shows coming up in New York December 4th and Boston December 12th. This week's story is from Pete Etchells. The story was recorded in November 2013 at Star of Kings in London as part of the Spot on London Conference. Uh, so, I, I love video games. I've, I've always loved video games. Uh, and I remember there was this one game in particular when I was about 12 years old that I was absolutely obsessed with. And it was called Blake Stone, Aliens of Gold. Does anybody know Blake Stone, Aliens of Gold? No. There's a reason for that. It came out like a week before Doom. And because Doom's awesome, um, it was so popular, it just fell into complete obscurity. It's a real shame, though, because I thought it was an awesome game. Um, I was going to say I thought it had a brilliant story, but the more I think about it, it's, it's not actually that great. The, uh, the storyline was that it's a first-person shooter, and you're this sort of futuristic Bond-style British intelligence officer called Blake Stone, which is an awesome name, and you're trying to fend off this alien invasion headed by the evil Dr. Goldfire. And there are, there are a few plot holes. Um, for some reason, the alien invasion is only happening inside this one building that you're in, uh, and the aliens have kind of neatly arranged themselves on different levels, and the, the, the big boss is right at the top of the building. So you've got to fight your way up and get into the elevators and get to the top. I don't know what happens in the future. Uh, for some reason, we lose the ability to use helicopters, uh, which would have made the game a lot shorter. Um, and we invent teleporters, which is awesome, but they only go sideways and not up and down. Um, so, you know, I had, a, I had a bit of a problem with the, the game, but I, I had a more kind of serious problem. Um, on one of the levels, uh, there was this corridor that you had to get through, and it was shut off by a door at both ends. And you had to get through this corridor to get to the end of the level. And when you open the door, uh, a bunch of monsters and aliens and lots of other nasty things would just sort of come straight at you. And I remember really vividly being genuinely scared about going into this corridor. I remember I'd open the door, I'd see some monsters, I'd freak out. And I shut the door, and I just spent the rest of the time wandering around the level that I'd already finished. Because uh, it was nice. You know, I killed everything. There weren't any nasty surprises. It was nice and safe there. Brilliant. Okay. Um, but there was, sort of, there was sort of a cost to that. I, I, never, I never got to see the, the next level or the level after that. I, going through that corridor was really scary, and it was difficult, and I, I just couldn't do it. And it was something that happened to my dad that put this into, into context for me. So my dad, he was called Malcolm. He was a surveyor. So he'd go around people's houses and value them for sales and things like that. His, uh, one of his claims to fame was that he once valued Robbie Williams' house. Wasn't that great? Um, <laughs> but I kind of think that in another life, he would have made a really good scientist. And my dad, not Robbie Williams. Um, he had a really analytical mind, and he was really good at problem solving. And he had a sort of very kind of scientific, methodical approach to things. So if there were any problems that came up in the, um, the office that he ran, he would... Uh, kind of change things systematically, methodically, see what works and what doesn't work. And I think like people that work for him really appreciated that. So anyway, one, one day I'm, I'm kind of pottering around the house, and he, he shouts at me, he calls me into the, the kitchen, and he uses that tone that parents use whenever you've done something wrong. So for me, it's if anybody calls me Peter instead of Pete, I know I'm in trouble. Um, so I kind of sheepishly wander into the, into the kitchen, and I, I see him there um, standing against the counter, 
uh, with a very sort of very sad look in his eyes. And he um, he kind of explains to me that he's been going to hospital for uh, for a few months and uh, having been having done a lot of tests. And the results of the tests came back, and he's been diagnosed with something called motor neuron disease, um, which basically means that he's got about a um, a, a one in three chance of surviving through the next five years. Um, motor neuron disease is a bit of a weird dis disease to me because on, on the one hand it's really rare, so about two in a hundred thousand people actually actually get it. But on the other hand, loads of people know about it. So uh, it's because people who've got it, like Stephen Hawking or Lou Gehrig, or if you've ever read the book um, Tuesdays with Maury, you'll you'll know about it. And we we don't actually know that much about it. We, we know what it does. It, it kind of basically causes motor neuron degradation, which um, is a fancy way of saying that it basically causes your muscles to waste away. But we don't really know much more of that. There are some kind of interesting facts and figures that I could tell you, but that kind of clouds from the fact that this is a complete and utter shit of a disease. Um, generally, it kind of starts with things like reduced dexterity in your hands and in your legs. Um, in my dad, it started in, in, in his legs fairly quickly, so it meant that very quickly he couldn't walk, um, he couldn't drive, and given that his job meant that he had to sort of drive around to different people's houses, that kind of put a, an end to that. Uh, later on, um, he lost the use of his arms, and he was a really avid painter, so that kind of that, that hobby went away. Um, and I think the thing that upsets people the most about this sort of disease is that it doesn't affect your cognitive functioning. So you can be just as bright and alert and interesting and interested on the last day as you are on the, on the first. Um, I've, I've never been particularly good at dealing with bad things, and, and this was a bad thing. Um, I tend to sort of deal with them by, by not dealing with them. I kind of, kind of put them in a box and lock it up and steal it away in a corner of my mind somewhere. And this was sort of no exception. So when I was there in the kitchen and he told me this, my, my, my initial reaction really was just absolutely nothing. I, I didn't feel anything. I, I couldn't feel anything. It was just such this huge, horrible piece of news. It couldn't have possibly been true. And I can't really remember what I did. I, I, I remember standing there for a bit in silence with him, sort of sharing the sense of defeat. Uh, but I can't remember much after that. I do remember not long after he told me, I went back to my room uh, and I needed to escape for a bit and I uh, booted up Blakestone and I uh, started playing that level that I was stuck on again. And I got to that corridor and all of a sudden I didn't feel scared of it anymore. Um, there were real, genuine problems to deal with in the real world and pixelated monsters on a computer screen just didn't seem like a big deal. So I kind of mowed through that corridor and I got to the end and I started getting really excited because I thought, shit, I'm at the end of the level now. I can actually see what's happening next. And I got really excited about seeing the next level. And what I hadn't realized was that all of this time that I was playing this sodding game, I'd been playing a shareware version of it. And when I got to the end of the level, that was the end of the game. And I never got to see the rest of the game anyway. Really frustrating. To this day, I've never finished the game. Um, so I, kind of, I, was, I was left with this odd, odd feeling inside, you know, I'd, I'd, you know gone away and I tried to hide and I tried to deal with this what now seemed like a minor trivial problem and I've got a, I've gotten over it and nothing happened because it didn't help me deal with this bigger problem um, that was still left to address and I just sort of felt empty inside. Um, I, I think you know we all like to think that we can cheat the odds a little bit and a one in three chance of surviving in five years is you know, you know we can take that sometimes right. Uh, my dad didn't get that far. He died about two years later when I was about 14. And I really remember quite vividly the day that he died. Um, I was playing uh, football at school, and it was about this time of year. It was the middle of November. Uh, and we were playing football outside in the freezing cold on, on an all-weather pitch. Um, and I assume that they call them all-weather pitches because it doesn't matter what sort of weather that you're using them on, they're always fucking horrendous to use. <laughs> So we're all kind of stood there slowly freezing to death, and I decide that this isn't particularly fun anymore, so I kind of trot over to somebody and try and tackle them. I'm awful at football, so I spectacularly miss the tackle and go over and really badly sprain my ankle. So I, off I go to hospital, uh, and we spend a, a few hours sort of there faffing around waiting to get seen. That's fine because it's still better than standing on that bloody old weather pitch freezing to death. Uh, anyway, I get, I get seen to, and um, I head home. And as I head home, um, I get a phone call from my granddad. And he says that my dad's taken a turn for the worst and that they're taking him to hospital. And as I'm driving home, uh, the phone call finishes. I look out the window, and I've kind of got a bit of a rising panic in my stomach. And I see this, this ambulance drive past, and I think, no, that's a coincidence. It couldn't be. And then I see my gran grandparents' car drive past. So I kind of rush home, 
get into some warm, dry clothes, uh, and rush back to the hospital. And we're all there in the hospital in, in a family waiting room that evening, and my dad's in, in the next room, and he's on a ventilator, and he's not responding to anything. And everybody knows it's kind of the end, so we all sort of take our turns to go in uh, and say our goodbyes. And uh, eventually it's my turn, and I go in. And... I, I kind of sit there and, and, and I'm staring at him and I, I don't know what to say. It's just uh, this ridiculous situation where I felt really embarrassed to say anything. And it's a silly situation. I knew it was a silly situation. Um, but it kind of felt like talking to somebody that was asleep. I thought, you know, because he's not going to respond to me. It's just ridiculous to, to try and say anything. And it was really hard to get anything out. And eventually I did. Eventually I said a few words and stuff. But I think sort of to this day, it's sort of my single biggest regret in life that I didn't say more then. And I kind of think back on how I dealt with his whole disease that uh, I wish that I kind of actually dealt with it myself so I could have helped him to deal with it more and been there more, more for him. So I didn't deal with his disease very well, but that didn't mean that he didn't. So all the way through those two years from uh, diagnosis, diagnosis to death, he remained absolutely incredibly strong. And I think the thing that I remember the most about that time is that the, the scientist in him still really shone through. So he had this really vigorous, infectious sense of curiosity about the world around him, and it meant that he just basically devoured every single piece of information he could find about the disease. And it got to the point that you know, he'd go and see his consultants and, and ask them for advice. And it turned out that actually he knew more about the disease than they did. And it became a very sort of collaborative process for him, which I think he quite, quite enjoyed in a, in a morbid uh, sort of way. But I kind of really think that without my dad's interest and that sort of infectious curiosity, without his guidance, I definitely wouldn't have ended up on the road to becoming a, a research scientist. And I think you know, that sense of wonder, that initial spark of curiosity about how the world works around you, and not just that, but wanting to try and figure out actually how it works, you know, systematically and methodically, just trying to break it down and figure out how it works. To me, that is the mark of a good scientist. It's not what sort of qualifications you've got or how many letters you've got after your name. So I think my dad taught me a, a lot about how to deal with things in, in life. and uh, They were sort of lessons that, that stuck with me all the way through, uh, all, all, th all the way through growing up. And I think I became particularly acutely aware of them back in 2010. Um, so in about September of that year, I'm finishing my PhD up uh, my funding's run out, um, I've not managed to find a job yet, everything's sort of feeling as though it's up in the air, and the only thing that I've got left to look forward to is writing my thesis. You know, it's this massive, kind of unscalable mountain to climb. And it didn't really help that I wasn't a particularly good PhD student. Um, I never took notes in meetings. Are there any students in the audience? For the love of God, take notes in meetings. It really does help towards the end. I never drafted any chapters. Um, so I'm kind of sat there on the first day of writing up my thesis, and I've not got anything to go off. And I'm sat there at my computer facing this blank document, and I have no idea what to do. Literally no words are coming to mind. I'm starting to get panicked again. So I think, oh, it's all right, I'll, I'll, I'll stand up and I'll go and find something else to do. So I stand up. As I start, as I start standing up, I think... I think about all those times when I was younger where I, tried, where I avoided all of these problems that I had. And I can really very quickly visualize my thesis turning into that stupid fucking corridor from Blake Stone again and how that became this massive insurmountable obstacle. But it's not. I mean, it's not a life or death situation. It's not scary. It's just words on a page. And I try and re remind myself of that and I, I think back to... Um, the costs that were associated with, with all of those things. You know, it, there was a, a cost to not finishing the game, and more importantly, there was a cost in that I never really got to tell my dad how I felt about him. Um, and this time, there was another cost that was associated. So if I didn't finish my thesis, I wouldn't get to become a research scientist, and I really wanted to do that. So I think of all, about all of that sort of stuff, and I sit down back at the computer, and I think about my dad, and I smile, and I just start to write. Thank you. That was Pete Etchells. Pete is a lecturer in biological psychology at Bath Spa University, UK, and a science blogger for the Guardian Psychology blog, Headquarters. When he was growing up, though, he really wanted to be a dinosaur. 
His research interests cover everything from how the human visual system works to understanding how modern technology, particularly video games, affects behavior and development. For more science stories, take a look at storycollider.org, where we have archives of the podcast and upcoming events. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Wecht, Aaron Barker, and Ari Daniel. The podcast is produced by Rose Eveleth. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to Star of Kings for hosting the show, to Lou Woodley, Laura Wheeler, and everyone at Spot On for helping put this together, and to Thanksgiving for thanks. Giving. Thanks for listening.